and John Donovan. Hey, Marty. As we were saying in the pre-show that uh, people don't get to see, uh, it's 2021. Today's uh, Friday, January 1st. And uh, it's kind of been a, a nice holiday up here in Sacramento. We, people in my church and I have spent a little bit of time um, letting go of the things in this year that we actually now the previous year that we didn't particularly want to bring into the new year. But I like to focus less on the past and more on the future. I like to uh, notice what happened for the purpose of building the world and the life I want to live right now. So, you know, that's, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's what the um, intentional living is about. Exactly. And although <clears throat> we, do, we do visit the past or the, uh, a trauma, um, that that is stuck inside us through through the process of being accountable or owning our character defect so um it, it's, a, it's a strange mix i, I don't want to hold on to the past either and yet when i find myself doing things over and over again or find myself in a pattern there it's definitely something from the past that's stuck in as a belief or a, a concept um that is driving the behavior so well and the paradox is, is that even though there's only the present moment the idea of the past or the future is just an idea a thought in our minds at the same time there all the things that came before me are the foundation upon which i stand today yes and so um for each of us individually uh, our lives are shaped by all of those experiences and of course for us as a species our environment, our, our human social environment is built on what we all have been doing since the beginning. So uh, the past has presence, but it's not determinative. It's there and it, uh, it, it shaped how we got here, but it also at the same time has nothing to do with my ability to decide that I wanna create something else today. Well, yeah, um, the, um, when I got into recovery, they said, um, this is a cunning, baffling, powerful disease. So, um, in my recovery, um, I've, I've tried to figure out, I figured out what that cunning, baffling, powerful thing is. And our bodies are designed to notice danger and stay away from it. So, and, and a side note, it's like people say, you know, when you learn how to ride a bike and you haven't done, done it for a while, you still know how. Your body retains the information. Well, it also retains the information of being yelled at or startled or abused or mistreated. And when it happens again in present moment, even though it was, well, for me, 65 years ago, it, 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 it um, triggers, and I don't like that word trigger, but it, it, it um, initiates, you know, say it again, initiates, it, it initiates a response that is in alignment with what happened to me as, as a, as a child. This part of us is subjective. It is simply looking out for our best interest. It is looking out to keep us safe. So if it says when somebody raises an eyebrow, I'm about ready to get hit back at five, when my current love of my life raises an eyebrow, I, I go into a meltdown defensive um, accusatory, what's going on, I'm not, and I have no idea that, that or I had no idea that that was happening. Now, now I do. So what I do is take a breath and go, oh, this is, this is from the past. If my behavior isn't in alignment with what's happening to me in the present moment, and, and that's on a continuum of one to 10. So if somebody's coming at we, me with a knife and I'm sitting there with a grin on my face, that's not in alignment. So if somebody's coming at me with a knife, I'm doing everything I can to stay out of his way. So to the level of um, somebody raised an eyebrow, um, 
So the eyebrow is a 0 0.02 and the knife is a, a 10. So when I'm acting appropriately within the context or the situation of my life, I'm free from past habits and patterns and triggers. When I'm not, when, I, when the intensity goes up or it drops, that's something about my childhood that's keeping me from being in the now. And this process I've developed about accountability and the four constants, the information is own, own, the behave, own the behavior that's out of alignment, like I'm arrogant. Um, own it, feel that when I say I'm arrogant, it, it aligns with that childhood trauma. There, the, and it's pre-verbal, non-verbal, emotional uh, response that my body's built to do to keep me safe. So when I own the behavior, it, it resonates with that trauma. So there's a, every time I do this, um, it is counterintuitive because I, I don't want to be arrogant. And yet I find myself in this arrogance attitude. So when I own it, there's, a, there's an ease, there's a relief, there's a, a swelling, there's a, a whelming. And in that moment, I can, I can written, now that I know that that response, the arrogance comes from childhood trauma, I can breathe and become lucid. And what I want is to be kind and to be assertive or to be gracious. And then I can create that intent it is my intent to be gracious. And like I said before, the, the arrogance triggers the emotional response. I say it is my intent to be kind and it melds with that. Um, I, I don't know who said it, but to heal an old wound necessarily, I need to create the, an, an emotion equal to or greater than the trauma. So when I say arrogance, that's that moment of, and then it is my intent to be kind from the emotional place of awareness. Then that kind mixes and overlaps and goes down and reframed so my behavior automatically is less arrogant. And, and the trick is, is to catch myself with my hand in the cookie jar. I'm arrogant, I'm entitled, I'm mean, I'm controlling, I'm needy. At those moments is the perfect moment to validate myself that I, there's something happened to me. I don't have to know what it was. I just happen, I have to know that it did happen. And when I say these character defects, that moment comes, there's a self-validation and it is my intent to be a loving, caring, nurturing grandfather or father or spouse. And that's the um, hermetic chamber. The lead is arrogance, the gold is kindness. And the manifestation is now from a mixture of that lead and gold. And you do it enough times, the lead kind of settles to the bottom and you, you have this this motivational force that's not uh, governed by childhood responses or childhood reactions that are necessary for that child to stay safe whether he freezes whether he starts screaming and yelling whether he whatever his behavior is is in alignment with the trauma so and he survived it i'm, I'm alive now i survived my childhood so that says, when this happens, do it again. Go, go to the high level of intensity. When I do the accountability process, it mellows that response out. And I can, in the moment, if I need to set a healthy boundary, like that, that hurt, when you said what you said to me, that hurt, or please don't do that, um, or um, you're stepping on my toe, please move. Um, or when you left last night, I got scared. Um, my abandonment issues came up. And I just want you to know that, that I love you. And make those connections that, that I, for most of my life I couldn't make in my relationships. A lot to unpack there, my friend. Um, <laughs> so what I'd like to maybe start out with uh, is particularly I'm always thinking in this podcast of somebody who's listening to us for the first time and um, I'd like if you'd be willing to talk a little bit more about the role of 
the feeling body, the emotional body in this healing work. Because what I notice um, consistently since I started adult children of alcoholics uh, attending those meetings, uh, as well as the meetings that we've developed around this practice, that a common theme, particularly for the newcomer, is the, the realization that we just don't feel. And that, that when I ask somebody as a facilitator of a meeting, well, how are you feeling right now? Oftentimes people get this bewildered look on their faces. Like I just asked them something in a foreign language. And, um, and over time, of course, we become aware of how our inability to feel is actually part of that protective mechanism that you were talking about earlier as a response to traumatic feelings and, and traumatic uh, uh, impositions on our, on our existence as little kids. So how do we, why is, why is the feeling so important or essential to the accountability practice? And how can we start to learn to feel if we haven't been feeling in the past? Good. Um, the, the, the way to start feeling is to admit you don't feel. You're estranged from your feelings. You're cut off at the neck from your body. Without that awareness, you, you're looking for something. And um, to say, just like a child would be looking for something to say when um, a parent in a, in a harsh uh, sometimes abusive voices, what do you think you're doing? Or what's wrong with you? And um, um, you weren't able to emotionally regulate or um, frustration tolerance, uh, and it's stuck. So if, if um, men are told, don't feel, don't cry, don't be a sissy, and then they go, they're, they're looking for help, they maybe go to therapy, or, or some men's group, and the first question is, or they go to Rusty Nail, and the first question is, how do you feel? It's like, I, it's like, what do you want? It, it's like, what am I supposed to say? I'm, I'm like, um, I'm, um, I came here, didn't I? I mean, it's like, so there, it's, it's so far removed from our awareness just based on the social conditioning, let alone the, the trauma. And I believe the social conditioning um, is, is a race consciousness or societal consciousness of the d dysfunction that happened in, in the family of origin. So it's an outcropping in, on a, in a social way of the same issue. Another thing is my experience of my humanness is male, masculine. So when um, I'm in a relationship and somebody asks me a question, well, questions that from my childhood were I was in trouble, I was getting set up. So when my partner says, like, where have you been? I get into an adrenaline rush because I'm, I'm scared and I don't know it, we, we tag that angry, men are angry, they, they yell, scream, what, what are you, how come you're asking me that question, don't you know who I am, uh, where do you think I've been, instead of answering the question. So that question creates a, an adrenaline rush, and the adrenaline mimics emotion. My hands get, palms get sweaty, my heart rate goes up, I feel this puff in my chest or uh, this drop in me to, to get away. And then somebody says, you know, embrace your emotions and you have it mixed up with this adrenaline rush because it, it's an adrenaline has those three things. I think it takes you out of your emotional body into response mode. It takes you out of your mind, takes you out of your rational mind and you lose context of the situation you're in. You're just, you're just responding in a knee-jerk way. And then um, we, we equate that to an emotion. And then we ask the man, what do you feel? And he's like, are you kidding me? What, what does that got to do with anything? Just tell me what to do and I'll move on with my life. I came here for you to tell me what to do. Um, 
So that's uh, what, what I say, adrenaline, and then the social conditioning we have, the family of origin trauma, the, the emotions get um, stuffed. And as a child, uh, the parent's job is to help the child emotionally regulate. Well, if, if the parents haven't emotionally regulated, the, there's no way they can guide a child through emotional regulation. Um, um, Explain what you mean by emotional regulation, if you would. Um, that's responding in the present moment according to the situation, in alignment with the situation. If I'm sitting here in this thing and a loud noise happens, somebody banging on the door, it's going to get my attention. It's going to, it's like, what's that? That's an emotion. It's, it's, a, it's a heightened awareness to, to, be, to orient. That's an emotion. That's you can call it fear. You can call it startle. That's how my body gets the information quickly before I can think about what's going on. So I'm in a in a place to respond and stay safe. Um, where are we at? Help me. Emotional out. regulation. Emotional regulation. Parents' responsibility. <clears throat> so I was, uh, and I told the story before. I picked up my grandson at his grandmother's house um, and was taking him home and he was upset because his mom didn't pick him up. Um, so he was um, screaming. He was saying, no, I don't want to go. He was running away from us. And I stayed calm. I just, okay. I, and I fed back to him what I saw was going, I see you're frustrated. Your mom said she'd pick you up and she's not here. I can see that you're disappointed. I just talked. I know he doesn't know, but he I was giving him the words to describe his feeling. If that happened to me, I would say, she lied to me. She said she'd be here. What's wrong with her? Well, there's all kinds of reasons somebody could be late or not do what they, they say. He's learning that. So if I would have went up to him and shook him and said, act right quit doing that. That's not a big deal. I would have dismissed his emotional experience. So um, another time I picked him up and he was sad because he left his grandmother's house. He was sad because he didn't miss his mom. So he'd sit in the back of the car and he'd start, uh, <laughs> and then he'd build himself up into a cry. So he was relating sad with emoting, with crying. Now, if that had happened to me 40 years ago with my kids, I would have said, quit your, quit being fake. That's, that's silly. And stopped him. I listened to him for um, the, the drive home was 20 minutes. And he would bring something else up. I'm sad about the, the dog. And then he'd go, uh-huh. And then you start this crying. He was, he was attaching sadness with tears, with crying. That, that's emotional regulation. And for me to simply watch and guide and comment, I see you're sad. I see you're crying. You, you, you must really be sad about the dog or about grandma or about mom. So he got the attachment to his body that what was happening to him is, is exactly right. He's practicing feeling. And um, I, I've been practicing feeling for the last 20 years. So he was in good company. He was able to, to do the, the fake, what I would have called, classified as fake cry. He was simply practicing. It was tremendous. I, I, was, I was so happy for him. And by the time we got home, he was on to playing with trains or let's play kickball or whatever was going on in his little four-year-old mind. It was incredible. So we're talking about the, the centrality of emotion to the uh, accountability practice. So um, based on what you just said, um, I know we've talked about this before, but again, for the, the newcomer, I think this is really critical for our appreciation of how this process works, which is that trauma, childhood trauma is the result of emotions that were not allowed to be naturally completed. Correct. Right. So in the case that the two examples that you gave, on the one hand, reflecting back to Solomon, his own process, and um, essentially giving him the permission to feel what he's feeling, 
versus what you would have said to your kids. So when you said something to your kids, you know, stop that. Who do you think you are? What's wrong with you? Those are ways that emotions were intervened upon so that they couldn't be completed. Correct. But the energy has to go somewhere. Yes. And so that's, as I understand it, that's the, that's what trauma is. It's somehow our bodies and nervous systems absorb this incompletion, essentially gets perverted and stored so that now fast forward ahead 60 years, you, you see the eyebrow twitch in your partner and that initiates this uh, memory, this emotional yes. memory, not, a, mm -hmm. not, not an intellectual memory, an emotional no. memory. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so baffling is because there's no thought that intervenes. It's just yeah. eyebrow goes up, holy shit, what did I do? Right. Without, in my experience, there's not a nanosecond of space between the, the evidence coming in and the reaction coming out. Yeah, exactly. And it's quicker than you can think. Right. Our bodies are designed to keep us safe at hyperspeed. There are emotional body processes 4 million bits of information per second. Our rational mind, I keep saying four, I heard four, that seems unreasonable to me. Um, and I'll say four to 400. We'll just say a fraction. Per second. So it, either way, we're, the rational mind is um, not designed to, for survival. It, our bodies are designed for survival. And then to say, here's another thing. If, if the, the startle response or the, the um, survival response is fight, flight, freeze. And we've added another one, the please. So it's fight, flight, freeze, please. Well, as a man, I am not going to freeze, nor am I going to please. Fuck you. So I'm stuck in, I got to fight, flight. And those are my only options. I either knock you out or get the hell out. And in between those two options is my life, is my conscious uh, wants and desires and, and um, uh, needs that need to be satiated through cooperation. So if I'm stuck in a fight flight, everything is a fight flight, I have no leeway to connect. There's no bonding time. It's all, it's all head stuff. Um, or, or well, I say I wouldn't please, but I'll bend over backwards, or I used to bend over backwards for whatever relationship I was in and then get mad at them for not being grateful. It's like, that's part of the please um, stuff that's stuck in me also, so. So let's, uh, let's take a minute then, if you would, to give somebody who's watching for the first time or first few times, the, let's walk through the accountability process and, and show show through the process from beginning to end that the, the, the power of the emotion to to be the, the driver of this work. Okay. So uh, by the time we get to taking somebody through the accountability tree, we've, we've discussed a couple of things. And one of the things we discussed is what do you want that you don't have? So if, if I'm in a space where I'm looking for something or I'm, I'm only willing to, to take in information that is new. If I say, um, when I first walked in to a 12 step meeting, what I wanted was a moment of peace, a moment where this shut down. So I wanted something. So I was open to what they were saying. So when they come to the accountability, the intentional living, uh, rusty nail, what, the first thing is, what do you want that you don't have? Okay. So once we've established that, that they're lacking something there, we explain to them that where you are now without that, without whatever you're looking for is simply in alignment with what happened to you. It's you that brought you, you to this place of lack. For me, it was peace. I had no peace. So understanding that, this is a way to find peace. And then we say, own where you're at. Be accountable for where you find yourself. 
And that's when I say, I don't know what you guys say in the Rusty Nail Club, arrogant, entitled, mean, controlling, or needy. Which one of those fit you? Which one of those resonate? You may not believe- In the that moment that we're doing the work. In the moment we're doing the work. Right. In the moment that they're, they're open to looking for something they don't have, um, knowing that trauma was the instigator of where they find themselves, they're in a pattern of behavior. So I say own the, own the behavior. Now, we're going to start out with character defect or things you really don't want to own. I, before my recovery, I didn't want to say I was arrogant because I knew a lot of arrogant assholes that I didn't want to be like. And yet in certain situations, specifically with my partner and my children, I was hella arrogant. I was the, I was the definition of arrogance. So when I owned it, I'm arrogant. There's something that happened internally. I couldn't put my finger on it. I couldn't cognize it. I couldn't rationalize it. There was just this, uh, and then some, somebody said, what do you want? Uh, I want peace. So create the intent. It is my intent to have peace. It is my intent to live in peace. And what was happening and what we do in the Rusty Nail Club and soon the uh, meeting I'm going to do, the um, Digging in the Dirt Club, is we access the emotion of the trauma. Arrogance is in alignment with trauma. So if I validate myself that, that something internal in, in me said arrogance was the best place for me to survive, that makes sense to me. And emotionally, that, emotionally, there's a body whelming. I can even feel it now when I say it. There's a, there's a whelming of energy. And in that, and it's like a, it's a constellation of things. There's my thoughts are, I can see pictures of the past and things I did with people. And, and it's more of a feeling than a, than a cognization. And in that openness, it is my intent to be kind. And it fuses with that. Um, Peter Levine, I think it was Peter Levine said that you cannot heal a trauma unless you bring the resonance or the, the feeling that the trauma is there with somebody who is safe and a guide to validate that. Even if you didn't say it is my intent to be kind, there's a healing. Because when people in the Rusty Nail Club say, own one of these, and mine is needy and controlling, I'm controlling, everybody's looking at them like, yeah, we know, so are we. There's this welcoming, <laughs> and that in itself is healing. And then they're, if they don't automatically move to my intent is, they're guided, what, what do you want? Well, I want to be kind. Well, create the intent. It is my intent to be kind. And that's the, the healing. You, it, it, they say in, in, I don't know which 12 step, you can't, you can't heal it unless you feel it. Well, the accountability process is, is even being so counterintuitive, naming, owning the character defect, like I'm an alcoholic or I'm a codependent or I'm a relationship addict, is in itself relieving because you I, I felt at home. There was this safety and this whelming that happened that that my body did. Because me, tough guy, I'm not, I don't cry. And I had tears, and I, I explain it this way. I had tears falling out of my face. I wasn't crying. I had tears falling out of my face. That's an emotional state. That's emotion. And one of the things I do with people when they own the character defect or the the, um, there's another word for it, the, the, where they find themselves, arrogant. Um, I lost my train of thought. Um, that's self-validating. Um, what is it? Uh, anyway. I got, I, I thought uh, for the visual learner, I've got the, I'm going to put up the page from your workbook with the accountability uh, diagram. Good. Yeah. Well, maybe we could just, uh, you know, use that to show people what you were just talking about. There. Yeah. Very good.
Because one of the things we didn't say yet is no blame, no judgment, and that's at the top of the process. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, yeah, I get that from us having done it for so many years. I know. It's just automatic for us that when I when I own a character defect or I own something I did like dismissed you, I just dismissed you, which is violent. I, I know that that we're going to no blame, no judgment. I'm just going to say what the behavior was, knowing that it came from past trauma, and no blame, no judgment. As soon as I blame or judge, criticize, um, call myself a name, I lose the moment to to feel the emotion. So the no well, blame, no judgment. And in essence, of from what you were saying earlier, I'm actually just re-triggering the process because I'm now creating adrenaline. Because when I do emotional violence to myself, I generate adrenaline, which moves me again out of feeling or out of the authentic feeling, like you were saying earlier. And so yeah. now, I'm, now I'm back in the trap. Yep. I'm back in the circular, energetic prison mm -hmm. of, of uh, and it's all avoiding the truth. It's all designed to keep me out of the truth and keep me in safety. Yes, safety that a two-year-old has designed in an emotional, um, in an emotional uh, configuration. Not the the adult may not want to be there, but there's that unhealed trauma that's got the power until until, like you said, um, I can I can generate an even more powerful emotion. Which is what which is what we do when we get down to the bottom of this work here. Right. This tree. <clears throat> so so with the with the judgment or the blame, it's either self-deprecating or other deprecating, which is what you just said, a re-traumatization, uh, another stuff down of that pain and hurt. Yes, it's incredible. But when I'm willing to speak this truth, oh my gosh, I just realize I'm arrogant. Mm -hmm. As it says, as it says here, that leads to an emotional state. And my experience, John, is it leads to an emotional state that I've been not wanting to feel, that I've been right. trying to avoid. And yet, <laughs> just like you said, there's a recognition, there's a coming home relaxation that occurs in my body. It's so counterintuitive. If you're listening yeah. to this for the first time, it, I, I don't blame you if you go, well, that's a bunch of nonsense. Um, because you have to experience it to know it to be true. Yes. Yeah. So there is an emotional state and it and initially feels like, as I think you were saying, just feels like release or relief. Yes. But my experience is that that actually is the doorway to something powerful. And it's usually happiness, joy, mm -hmm. exuberance, mm -hmm. giddiness. Yes. And these are all emotions that traumatized children do not allow ourselves to experience because oftentimes it feels like betrayal of the family system. If I'm happy and everybody else is unhappy, there's something wrong with me. Right. Or it also feels like out of control because joy is joy is kind of an out of control kind of feeling. And yeah. This little, um, this little kid can't allow things to get out of control. That's dangerous. Yeah. And, and being in your body, being in that spontaneous, joyful place for a child in a dysfunctional family is dangerous. It's scary. Yeah. It's opened you up for ridicule and humiliation. Okay. Opened me up. It opened me up for ridicule and humiliation. So, yeah. the, so the uh, the thing about the truth, when I say I'm arrogant, that's in alignment. That's what my body believes is true for me subconsciously. It's not in my it's not in my rational mind. So when I say the truth, it is actually uncovering the lie or the pattern. Um, right. And that automatically sets us in emotional state in a, in an emotional state. I tell people, you do not have to look for the emotion. It will happen. You simply breathe. And as the emotion is happening, it opens up this experience of who you really are, your original essence, to say, it is my intent to be kind. I'm, I'm a kind, giving, 
um, loving person. And, and then the intent comes out of that because we never know what these people are going to say, what they want. It, it's, it, this is um, pertinent to each individual because each individual has a different experience. And yet that truth excites their experience through their emotional feeling body. And they, uh, somebody may come out, I'm, I'm arrogant, and they go, I need to forgive myself. Well, okay, create the intent. It is my intent to forgive myself. It is my intent to love myself. It is my intent to be kind. There's as many statements from that truth as there are people. And when I say I want peace, that comes from my experience. It has a quality of my, my genuineness in it. When you say you want peace, there's a quality of Marty in that. When, when somebody else in the meeting says, I want peace, they're, they br they're bringing their quality to that word. Um, it, it is my intent to be in peace or is my intent to be kind. Um, and the line below, I intend, self-validation. I remember writing that on the, on the board, not knowing why. I, I had it, I, I think I had it on either side of the emotion. And I, I stuck it there. And what I've come to find out is that me going to the truth, just saying the truth of my trauma, the end result, that validates me. And, and I don't know how to validate myself because I was trained by people who were self-deprecating and other deprecating. I do know how to do that. But to validate myself, I, I had no idea what that felt like. Through this process, it, it's what I did not receive from my parents. It's that feeling I belong, I'm worthy, I, I have some value. Like I see my grandson after an episode and I say, I love you and I hug him and there's no punishment or how can, don't ever do that again or some kind of ultimatum to him is just, let's connect and I love you. That's validating. He knows what it feels like to be validated so that he can give that to himself. It's incredible. So that is, um, to follow the thread here, um, two things. Number one, what my experience is, is that the specific incidents that I'm walking, when I'm walking through this practice for myself is, like you said earlier, I bring, a, I bring my energy of peace when I say I want peace and so forth. So that when I'm doing this work and I'm in a specific emotional resonance arises in my body, what I've learned to do is to ask that resonance what it wants. Yeah. Like, what do I want? So that part of me, because that is that emotional resonance is I. So I say, what is it you want? And almost always some spontaneous um, desire gets named. I want mm -hmm. peace. I want relief. I want um, I want joy. And that, because it's automatic and it's voluntary, it's more powerful than the feeling I've been repressing. Yes. So when I invoke that intention, even though in my rational mind, I, I may be willing to admit, I don't know how to generate that. I actually just did. I actually mm -hmm. just did generate that by allowing yes. it, by calling it forth, by asking for it to reveal itself. Yes. And then for me, the way I understand this, we don't talk a lot about this necessarily in the accountability practice, but, um, for me, the I intend is the invoking of the higher power to, to create for me, which the Marty of me doesn't know how to create. Yes. So it's like a partnership. Mm -hmm. So I, what, what, what do I, I ask the feeling, what do you want? What do you want to feel? I just want, I want to feel peace. Okay. I intend to feel peace. And then I can leave that alone at that point. Oftentimes, Oftentimes in meetings, people say, well, I don't know how to do peace. Right. And we'll say, yeah, you're right. You don't. <laughs> you don't. But, but, and, but your higher power does. And just sit tight. It's coming. Right. <clears throat> exactly. Um, um, it's also 
an exercise in loving parent for people exactly. and adult children of alcoholics. This is actually an exercise where you experience, or I experience my own loving parent. I went to the truth. I put myself in a safe place with people who were not going to blame or judge. I did not blame or judge myself. I just said the truth. This is what happened to me as a child. This is the end result. Um, it is my intent to be loving. Um, that's, that's me being a loving parent to myself in the moment at 71 years old. Um, and that's what I missed from my childhood. So in, in ACA, they said, you know, our parents are the instruments of our existence and that we become our own loving parents. And this exercise is a visceral embodiment of loving parent. I remember I, we talked about this a few podcasts ago, uh, or this is, this is what I remember you said. Um, this it, So in Adult Children of Alcoholics, ACA, we talk about we're in the process of learning to reparent ourselves. And you said, this is the process of reparenting. Yes. This well, is the I, process. I wanna, I'm gonna offer a process. Yeah, okay, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, cause there's plenty of other ways to do it. And this is, th this, this experience, I can explain this all day long to a newcomer and, and I watch them and I go, okay, would you be willing to trust me and try it? And they'll, yes, no, maybe. Um, if they say yes, once they've been through it, there's an experience that, that no words can describe to them. And, and the response is they start leaning forward in their seats. They're, they're interested, they're curious, like, how did you do that? I want more. Get, tell me that again. It just did not register. I'm still, I'm still not knowing what the hell happened. And, and the practice is um, owning wherever you find yourself in that moment with your hand in the cookie jar. <laughs> I'm arrogant. I'm entitled. Uh, that was a mean thing. I, I just dismissed you. I'm going to own this cookie. I got it in my hand. It's happening right now. And that's the moment to self-validate, repair. And that reparenting is the... Um granting of unconditionality the granting of validation the granting yes. of um it's like it's like healthy attachment it's the generation mm -hmm. of healthy attachment using john bowlby's attachment theory that part of how we learn to become individuals in an environment where we are we feel taken care of enough to explore explore our individuality, explore our world, because we always have a place we can come back to in case we fall down and skin our legs and without being told you shouldn't have been out there. Yeah. You shouldn't have done that. Don't run with scissors in your hand. You'll poke your eye out. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I started this process in um, the jails and, and developed the intentional living. And I was in an environment of I, I don't want to say hostility. I, I get that the men in jail were grateful that I would at least come in and talk to them about either, even though what I was talking to them about wasn't what they wanted to talk about. Um, and when I first did a workshop at an ACA convention, it was so amazing to me that people just simply listened. And, and some were curious and asked questions and what ifs and and it was so much more congenial and inviting and because they have the laundry list. I mean, they, they, they have the, the list of traits that are um, endemic, is that the right word, to people who live, grew up in dysfunctional households. They uh, tend to love people they can pity. They get pity mixed up with love. They're afraid of authority figures, see personal criticism as a threat. That's already in their, in their language. So when I say character defects, there's something happened to you and this is what happened, this is the behavior, they get that. And we move quicker and faster. And it's really cool. But that points out a, uh, another feature of this work that's really essential. And that is, um, if it's not entirely 100% voluntary, I do it because I choose to do it, it's not gonna work. 
anything that's compelled or manipulated or uh, required doesn't work. No. Well, oftentimes when we're in meetings and I hear people say, well, I need to do this. I say, would you be willing to consider you don't, you don't need to do anything? Right. That yeah. if you choose to do it, it might have more power for you. The, the, the thing is, if you're externally motivated, chances are you're going to get information for somebody else um, that would be good for somebody else. And, and uh, in the jail, a, a lot of the guys were cons, manipulators. So they come in playing a good game, saying the right things. Right. And um, what I witnessed was after a while, they conned themselves right into an awareness. <laughs> it, was, it was like, so, so even people who are externally motivated, if they're exposed to this, there's a chance that it, something may spark in them. Oh, it's me. There's something in me. There's something I can do. I have power. I have volition. I'm not a victim. I'm not at the mercy of everybody's whim. Um, tell me more. Right. So cool. Yeah. Exactly. So there's well, value in, and and the the power of this also is because we are trained in those kinds of traumatic, dysfunctional family environments. We are trained to have an, a, a tacit belief that we are not in charge. And that's why we have to learn to manipulate and control and so forth. And so the, the yeah. notion of freedom is equally unknown to us or equally foreign to us as joy and these other, um, we could call them adult uh, experience states. So there's a there's an an out there's a there's an uh, a connection between fear and anger and um, feeling I have no control and feeling that I'm a prisoner of some kind. Along along with that, I normalized that behavior. Right. I saw it as everybody does it. What what are you talking about? It's like I. I I have a, when a memory came up when you were talking and I was thinking about normalizing, I was with uh, my family up in Shingle Springs and I don't know, the dog had gotten out and I was outside and I was yelling for the dog like I normally would do. Um, and some neighbors came out and, and I just stopped. I, I didn't want them to see me. I, I didn't like do anything rationally. I just stopped. And I went back into the house and, um, and forgot about it. Um, so I had normalized that behavior in my unit, in my family unit. Um, and anybody outside that, don't talk, don't feel, don't trust. So I automatically went back into my shell or into my safety zone, which was the uh, dictator of my house, the 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 mean king of my domain. Right. Well, that brings up a, 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 another point I'd like to uh, squeeze in here before our time comes to an end, which is part of our challenge in all of this is to recognize that we live in a culture that's replicating this on a mass scale. Yes. We can see this in particularly the social media where um, there's almost a bizarre uh, freedom for our id and nasty side to just proliferate. And um, so part of our challenge in recovery is to be willing to permit the rest of society to do what it does, to be able to make a distinction between um, the mass energies that show up as arrogance and controlling and being needy on a mass scale and all those other character defects that you were talking about, and find a way to um, forgive that so that I can heal in spite of the fact that this is what's going on around me. And that's a tough thing because it's difficult sometimes for us to, uh, because we're trained to blame ourselves for everything, it's sometimes difficult to just notice, yeah, that's what we all do. I'm participating in a mass behavior as well here and I don't, and so what do I want? Again, going back to the process, the tree, what do I want? I noticed that a lot of people behave this way um, that generates a feeling in me. 
that pisses me off, that frightens me or whatever. And now I'm back into emotional truth and I can work with that and go back toward what do I want anyway. Mm -hmm. oh. And and it has an effect on the uh, society. Yeah, it turns it around and, and, and generates that new energy back outward in that same process that you demonstrate that not only changes my own subconscious, but my subconscious is part of the collective subconscious. So there's also right. a change, even though it's not always discernible, um, it's still changing. There, there's a, there's part of the um, um, material is expectations or pre-planned resentment. So if I think I'm doing this and everybody else should act right, that's, a, that's an expectation that's gonna cause another resentment in me. So I'm willing, and, and I told the men at, at the jail, because I'd tell them about um, communication style and violence and be accountable. And they would say, yeah, but my wife is, and I, okay, all right, let me, let's be real clear. I'm asking you to do this without her, without anybody else. If you're willing to do this, do it by yourself. No expectations that you get any kudos for like being human. Um, <laughs> And uh, if you're willing to do that, it will change your life. If you're not willing to do that, everybody else has to do it too. Uh, good luck, because that's that's an expectation that's going to create a huge resentment inside you, and then you're going to blame me. Yeah, you know, John told me to do this, and now my life sucks. So well, okay, so don't do it. If, if you if you expect any kudos or anybody else to do what you're doing, don't do it. It's for you. Yeah. And that's, that's difficult. That's, that's hard thing for a man to hear. Um, that, that it's on, it's on him. It's his choice. Um, you think that's any easier for a woman to hear? No, well, I, I don't know. I don't have the experience of a woman, but I imagine it is. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't want to speak to what that experience. Is. I think it's a, I, my point is I think it's a human thing, not just a male yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, it's all it's it, it's it's um, it's uh, because we're social creatures, and we depend on other people for so much of what we need that we confuse that which we can generate for ourselves with that which we think other people can generate for us. And so it just becomes habitual to believe that my partner, my partner can make me happy, for example. And that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a social habitual belief that is, you know, rarely, rarely borne out in actual one-on-one -on -one relationships, but nonetheless, there it is. Yeah. And that's why it's difficult sometimes for us to believe these things because we've got years and years and years of alleged evidence that shows us otherwise yeah yeah that's uh that's a whole nother hour um podcast about relationships and expectations and i'm doing this for her no 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 you're not you're doing it for the relationship uh because the relationship is what you're building she benefits absolutely um, if I do something for my partner uh, and then and charge her with um, uh, I mark it on the checkoff sheet now she's got to do something back for me then it's a bar it's a barter system and you get what you get so everything I do in a relationship is for the relationship no obligation nobody has any obligation to reciprocate or give me back my old thought was because it says in the bible if I give you one you give me ten I've given you five now and I haven't got shit. So come on, it's your turn to, it's your turn to like step up here. It causes a World War III. At the very least. At the very least. Well, then uh, that's a perfect note to uh, end on. Let's uh, pick this up next week and uh, let's explore this in uh, greater detail because the relationship is really critical. Love is important to all of us. It's essential. And as as we can talk a little bit also about the love equals exercise that we do in the accountability practice yeah because we use that word and we, most of us don't know what it actually means right yeah 
yeah. or we have it confused with something that's that we that's not very pleasant. And so uh, next week, let's talk about love. Love angles, what was it, the old fifth dimension song, Lungs, loves angles, rhymes, and reasons, or whatever yeah. it was. I, I don't remember, I don't, it's not coming to me what that is, yeah. So also, you want to talk just a little bit about the new meeting you're starting? It's going to be uh, Saturday morning at 8.30, Zoom. I'm in the process of gathering my equipment to, to do this, creating an... Um, e-blast system uh, i don't know how to do that I, I probably need to talk to you about how you manage all that um okay and uh um i have a person helping me so it, it should be soon my my goal is before january we're we're live saturday morning somewhere. you mean by the end of the month by the end of the month okay yeah absolutely and you mean that's 8 30 pacific time 8.30, thank you. 8.30 Pacific time, um, Saturday morning, regular, every Saturday morning. Okay. Okay. And uh, so uh, also, you're, anybody watching this is invited to, uh, if you want to have an evening experience instead of a morning experience, we have our Rusty Nail Club that meets on Mondays and Thursdays at 6.30 um, Pacific time. So at the end of uh, at the end of this podcast, they'll uh, they'll be rolling up the screen ways to get in touch with me about Rusty Nail or John about his new process. Or if you'd like to talk to John one on one, or if you'd like to talk to me one on one, our contact information is at the end of this podcast. So John, two thousand twenty one. I'm excited. Who knows what? So who excited. knows what we'll create? Yeah, twenty twenty signifies clarity. You know, twenty twenty vision right. is like I, I got enough clarity. <laughs> I got all the clarity I need. Uh, I'm good. I'm good to go. Yeah. Famous wow. last words. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll see, uh, <laughs> see how that goes. Yeah. yeah. No more clarity, God. Yeah. God will yeah. Say, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. You think so? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, right. I'm talking about the clarity that 2020 dished up to us all. All right. Fair enough. Yeah, okay. All right, John. We'll talk to you next week. You